Okay, I'm ready to go. Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. It's my joy and privilege always to have the opportunity to open up God's Word with you. Uh, And I never want to take that for granted, but some weeks in particular are a deeper joy. And this has been one of those weeks, and so my prayer has been uh, in some way, shape, or form, Lord, uh, give them the joy that you've you've given given me all week long in this, this kind of cornerstone passage that that really sets up the rest of the Bible for us. So Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to be as you begin to make your way there. Um, When I was a kid, I was uh, what you would call a latchkey kid. Any other latchkey kids in here? Okay, a few. It was the best. So what that meant was our parents went off to work, and uh, especially in the summertime, I'd wake up whenever I want and, and roll downstairs, see that my mom had left me a list of chores. That's for, for new parents. We, kids uh, used to do chores. Um, <laughs> but not very well, because... I'd be like, okay, here's my list. My mom gets home at 6. At 5.58, I should probably be back and do these chores. Uh, But I would go out and and get my bike, knock on my friend's doors, gather the crew, and and we'd get on our bike. And like a pack of uh, roving wolves, we would just go through the neighborhood. And that was our summer day. And and when I was about 10, uh, we we were doing that. We heard the fire trucks come in. And we were like, that sounds like a few blocks over. Let's ride over there. And we we ride over there. And it was a scene. Like there was a geyser shooting out of the street. A a water main line had broken. And and it was just this geyser. And it was falling and creating this small little river. And and the fire trucks and everyone was trying to do something. But then I noticed something else. There there were news trucks there. Um, And there, there was, I don't know if it was four, seven, or nine. If you're an OG Colorado and you know what I'm talking about, but, but it was one of those. And I was like, man, there's television here. Like must've been a slow news day. Actually, it was just before the incessant 24 hour news cycle. So uh, they, they're going to report on it. And I, I see them reporting on it and, and she's standing in front of the camera and in the backdrop is the geyser and the waterfall. I'm like, this is it. This is my moment. I'm going to be on television. <laughs> And you got to understand, this is before the internet, before Twitter, like that was the pinnacle of fame. And so I, I was like, I'm going to be on television. So I, I, I but I'm going to be respectful and, and I'm 10 years old and I set my bike down and, and, and I, I, I see where the camera is hanging and, and, and I'm walking in the water and I'm like 50 feet back and I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how long I did this for, but I was just like, well, here I am. I'm on television. Look at me, somewhere out there, I'm on people's screens right now. I thought it was awesome. And so I got on my bike and went back to my street and and my neighbors, and my neighbors even said, hey, hey, we saw you on TV. I was like, yes. They're like, well, really just half of you because the screen cuts you off. We just saw your legs walking (laughs) back and forth, back and forth. And you're like, man, that is a ridiculous story. That's a ridiculous attempt at fame. That's a ridiculous attempt at uh, finding an identity in that. But, but, but here's what I want to say. That, that little attempt of mine, and, and I've done many, many more in my lifetime and will continue to uh, do stunts and otherwise, be like, hey, look at me, look at me, look how, uh, how awesome I am. Like that's just kind of in us. Like, like that little 10-year-old ridiculous derpy kid, uh, that attempt, it, when you start to look at and, and, and think about the, the scope of eternity and, and the scope of even the universe, and, and, and you see all of our little attempts to say, look at me, look at me me, uh, that, that's ridiculous, but so are every other one on the face of the planet. So whether you're a little 10-year-old trying to get on TV, uh, or you're a, someone that's going for his second term as a president, in the end, Ecclesiastes is going to tell us it's all meaningless. It's all pointless little attempts to make much of ourselves. So you might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't like that. That makes me feel small. And so let me just clarify. I, I don't mean to make you feel small this morning. I mean to tell you, you are small. <laughs> it's not about feeling small. You, you are small. And that's okay. That's okay. That's, that's how we were made. But, but we're, we're in this this age and time where modernity gave way to post-modernity, where we, um, we just have this crazy pressure on us, and it is a pressure, to just kind of come up with definitions for everything. 
So uh, when the enlightenment came up and, and people began to question, well, who is God and what, what is God, that, that began to give way to postmodernity. And so people and, and even in us in some way, shape or form think, well, well, my God is like this. God, God is like that. Or I can't believe in a God who is like this. Or my God would never do this. And, and, and we become the sole arbiters of, of what's ultimately true about God. And that then just gives way to, uh, when, when you don't have a uh, collective understanding of ultimate reality, that that then also gives way to just a, an upheaval of the whole world. So, so if we don't know who God is, then we also don't know who we are. And, and that we have this cultural moment where we have to define ourselves all the time. And, I, and I, at, at first, it sounds like an amazing promise. You could be whoever you want to be. You can, you can make your own name great. You can uh, get your own fame. And that sounds amazing, except for then it becomes kind of this crushing promise. Like, you have to create an identity worth everyone applauding. You, you, ha- you, you better do it right. And if, if that identity doesn't work out for you, you better exchange that for something else. And there's just this constant pressure to define ourselves and to show the world, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Now, this passage that we're going to look at this morning is incredibly good news. And, and here, here's the good news. The good news is you and I do not get to define anything. You and I do not get to define who God is, and we don't get to define who we are. Now, again, to our postmodern ears, that, that first sounds like kind of oppressive. Like, well, no, no, I like to kind of just determine my own identity and, and future and, and worth and all that. But, 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 but I'm telling you, I, I promise you that if we dig into this and see what God has for us in this passage, this is good news. We don't define who God is. We don't define who we are. And that's incredibly good <clears throat> news. Calvin, in his first, le- first line to the book of Institutes, he, he says this, Nearly all wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Now, now, when he says the knowledge of ourselves, he's not talking about our modern uh, therapeutic uh, deistic view of ourselves. He, he's saying w- when you really understand who you are, uh, where you're broken, where you've gone wrong, th- then you can start to understand uh, where the way back is. And when you understand who God is and how those things come together, all true knowledge comes from there. So if you have your Bible, Exodus chapter 3, we're going to get some knowledge this morning about a God who is self-defined. And this is incredibly good news. Exodus chapter 3. Last week, Rick uh, opened up the, the, pa- the chapter where Moses, now 80 years old, he has uh, been for 40 years out, out of being prince of Egypt. He is wandering around looking at the backside of sheep all day long. And uh, he, he thinks his life's coming to an end when the bush is on fire and uh, God calls to him to come closer. And it's appropriate that God would appear as fire, right? Because in our world, fire is both drawing us in on a cold night. You want to get close to the fire, but it also pushes us away. Don't get too close. And so as Moses comes in, God says, Moses, come here, but take off your shoes. This is holy ground and don't get too close, Moses. And he begins to have this interaction with the, the God of the universe. And in the course of the conversation, God says something. He gives, he gives a commission to uh, Moses. This is from last week, but starting in verse 10. He says, now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, now Moses knows he was a prince of Egypt. He knows the task that's before him. It's a massive task. Uh, the most powerful man uh, who had ever lived up until this point is in control with the most powerful army and the most advanced technology. And so well, when God gives Moses this amazing commission, Moses does what you and I do because we have a commission too. When, when the task is so big, he, he first looks at himself. He sees his failure, his past, his inad- inadequacies, his inability. And, and he's like, no, I can't do that. 
He looks inward. Look what it says. And he asks this question, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God's answer is, is not really an answer. He's just another statement. And God said, I will be with you. It's the promise of God for the people of God throughout the whole Bible. God will be with you. This God who we saw last week is both transcendent above and beyond all, who stands outside of time and space, uh, also is imminent. He comes near. He sees. He hears. He's present. He's close. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So, so that's, that's all recap from last week. So if the first question is, who am I? And, and, and the answer uh, is, well, I will be with you. That leads to a second question. Well, then, who are you? Right? It, it's, it's a good question. And see, Moses does not yet know that, that uh, God with us is an overwhelming majority in every case, right? If God is with us, it doesn't really matter about our capacity, our ability, our history, our failures, our successes. None of that matters if God is with us. But he's got a question. If you're not going to answer, who am I, then I and you're going to say you're going to go with me, then I've got to ask you, who are you? Verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So so in the ancient Near East, when, when Moses is asking this question, he's not just asking for information. He's not just saying, hey, could we exchange business cards so I can go and and show them? He's not just saying, I I need to know the name in the sense that we have our names. No, in in the ancient Near East, in that time, your your name was your character. It was your reputation. It was your capacity. It was your history. It was your future. And and so Moses is saying, if I'm going to go back to that land where uh, I left in shame, if I'm going to go back now and I'm going to say to the people that they might ask me, who are you and who's with you? And what will I tell them? What will I tell them? And God, by the way, has no obligation to anything ever at any time, but he condescends and he actually is going to answer Moses. He's going to answer Moses when Moses says, who are you? In verse 14, we see the answer. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you, sent me to you. Now, immediately this is, this is almost deliberately designed to blow up our categories. God, Moses is asking for a label, and God gives Moses a theology. Moses is asking for a noun, what's your name, and God gives Moses some verbs, a verbal sentence. In the Hebrew, it would be haya asher haya. I am that I am. The verb to be. Uh, so I'll, I'll put the Hebrew up on the screen. So, see... The, see these little dots below here? These, these actually are not original to the Hebrew text. They're added in the 6th century. They're, ver, they're, they're, they're vowels because Hebrew doesn't have vowels in and of itself. And so in an attempt to try to understand how to pronounce the name, they came up with these vowels. So we don't really know for sure if this is how you pronounce it. The, the, the transliteration would be Y-H-W-H, which is next slide. Y-H-W-H, which is where we get uh, the, the divine name Yahweh from. Uh, but most often in your Bible, it's going to be translated as I am or Lord. And it's going to be all caps. And so when you're reading through the Old Testament and you see Lord all caps, what, it, what it's actually saying is this, this first Hebrew word. It's the divine personal name of God, Lord. But out of respect, they don't say it. So when I was in Hebrew class, uh, um, we kind of took on the, the ancient Hebrew tradition that with the divine name, you don't just say that. You don't want to blaspheme that name. We would substitute that name with just the generic name, Adonai, Lord. 
And if there were any Messianic Jews in our class, if for whatever reason we were taking a class, uh, taking a test or something like that, and we were forced to write in the Hebrew the divine name, that Jewish person would take that piece of paper and keep it for the rest of their lives safe. This is the divine name. This is the the name that God self-reveals. Well, what is God saying when he says, I am that I am? Uh, Haya, Ashir, Haya. What what is God saying? He's saying many things. One, he's repeating the name. So in Hebrew, that's an emphasis for emphasis. It's saying, I am fully all that I have been, am, and truly all that I ever will be. It's an emphasis on his wholeness. It's an emphasis on his freedom. I am the one self-defined thing in the whole universe. No one can define me. I am self-defined. It, it emphasizes his consistency. I am. I, I, it could be translated, I be, or, or just simply be. What's your name? Be. I, I, I was, I be, I will be. Past, present, and future is, is built into this. It's, it emphasizes an expectation of knowing him and, and, and learning more and more and more and more about him forever. This is why heaven will never be boring. God is infinite. And he will continue to reveal his glory to us for all of eternity. There will never be a moment where we're like, I get it now. I know fully I am. No. There is always more to discover in God. It's an emphasis of This is the character that you can trust and you can put your hope in. God is saying, I am the center of everything. I am running the show. I am the same every day forever. I am the owner of everything. I am the Lord. I am the creator and sustainer of life. I am the savior. I am more than enough. I am inexhaustible and immeasurable. I am God. This is what God does when he reveals his divine name. You, You know who you should tell is with you when you go to the Israelites? Tell them, I am I am all these things. But did you notice something else in that? If that's the divine name of God, I am, present tense verb to be, if that's his divine name, he actually answers Moses' first question. I don't know if you see that in there. Remember Moses' first question? Well, who am I? He actually answers the question for us as well. Who am I? If God is I am, that means you and I, in some sense, are I am not. I am not. I am not running the show. I am not in control. I am not the solution. I am not the owner of anything. I am not all powerful. I am not the Savior. I am not the Lord. See, God, who defines himself, also now defines us and brings definition to all of the universe. Everything that ever was and is and will be, God is the definer of all these things. And so he, he begins to uh, unpack this. In fact, the rest of the book of Expo- Ex- Exodus, one commentary said this week, is an exposition on the name of I am. We're going to learn more and more and more and more and more about I am uh, through the book. So we won't get it all today. And like I said, we won't get it all next year or 10 million years from now, but we are going to learn more. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name. The name you, this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Do you you see the past, present, and future tense of this? Tell them, uh, tell them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the past is here now. This is my name forever from generation to generation. And now we find ourselves in the story. We're part of generation to generation. We have this incessant drive in us to to make a name for ourselves, to to live out a story for ourselves. And God is saying, that story is really small. You can exchange that story for the story that goes on forever and ever and ever. You have a choice this morning. You can live for your name or you can live for the I am name. Verse 16 says, 
Go to <clears throat> assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. <clears throat> now God is about to, about to give a spoiler alert to us and to Moses. But notice how he talks about the future. It's unlike anyone or anything else. Listen to what he says. Verse 17, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt, in the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, notice all caps, so I am the God of Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, all caps, I am our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Verse 21. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in the house for articles of silver and gold and clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Now notice, at at first glance, when you read that, you might just think, man, God is super confident in the future. But it's more than that. There's actually, there's no no room for confidence here. God who stands outside of eternity, stands outside of time and space, just says, this will happen. You will go and say this to this person, that he will respond like this. You will go say this to this people, then I will do this. Then they will respond like this, and then you will plunder the Egyptians. It's just, it's beyond confidence. This is the God who knows. He's not hoping. He's not using all of his God power to try to orchestrate things to, to work out just like he's, he's telling Moses. No, he knows. This is I am. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows. Now, we, we, we can't talk like this, or we shouldn't. Sometimes we do because we misunderstand who we are, that we are I am not. Sometimes we're like, oh, I will do this, and I will do that, and, and I will do this. And you're like, no, you won't. Maybe, but we don't, know, we don't know if we'll make it to the end of this service today. We all think we will, but we don't know. God knows whether or not we will. He is I am. He is I am. And again, this is incredibly good news. We don't define I am. I am defines us. He's the one who made you, who knows you. He's the one that, that, it's the audience of one that you are called to live before. And when you start to understand that you can know I am, you don't care if you can get on TV as a 10-year-old. <laughs> I got I am knows me. I'm known by I am. This is incredibly good news. This, is, this means that the pressure is off. The world is exhausting. We're all so exhausted trying to define ourselves and make a name for ourselves and and show the world I'm worthy. See me, look at me, check this selfie out. How many likes did I get? Uh, So on and so forth, whatever. How how big of a business can I make? How good can my family be? Uh, It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the pressure's off. God says, who said you had to define yourself? I'm the one that defines you. And that's good news. The call to, of this passage, the call of the Bible is to, to, to be known by I am and to know I am. That's it. That, that's what life is all about. So, so I wrote out this phrase in studying this week. I'll put it on the screen. <clears throat> Knowing and being known by I am, there it is, realigns our lives to the ultimate, the eternal, and the good story we were made for. That's it. That, that, that's the, the, that, that should be the thesis of, of our lives. Knowing and being known by I am realigns our lives to the ultimate, the eternal, and the good story you and I were made for. That's the narrative. That's the ultimate story. Here's the deal, though. We lose the narrative, don't we? Like, we lose the narrative all the time. 
We start to think, well, I think life is about this or that. I think life is about making a name for myself. Uh, I, I'm going to go do this. And when, when we do that, we, we, that's when we experience anxiety because things aren't working out the way we hoped. We experience stress. We experience shame because we fail and we fail and we fail when we try to live our own story. We experience uh, pride. And if we, if we do succeed in what we're trying to succeed in, uh, we think, look at me, how great am I? It, it's, it's when we lose this narrative. You can put, leave that back up there. When we lose this narrative, we lose the story. We, it's, it's, it's what the Bible describes as sin. When we live for anything other than for knowing and being known by I am, we sin. So we, we start to think other people should serve us. We start, start to think that our, our spouse, our kids, our, our coworkers, our friends, that they should uh, bow down and serve me and, and because we've lost the narrative. Sin is losing this narrative. And, and so what, well, what does repentance look like then? It, it's coming back to the narrative. It's like when, uh, so this summer as we were driving around Europe and we had our, our Apple Maps or Google Maps on all the time, there were multiple occasions, even though it was telling me exactly where I should turn, there were multiple occasions where I just missed the turn or I, or I made a wrong turn. And what happens in that moment, right? Siri's not like, you idiot. You've lost it. Like, thankfully, I think you can get that app, but I, I don't have that app. Siri isn't like, well, I guess you won't get to your uh, destination now. Like, no, it's like rerouting, rerouting, or turn around, or take a right here. Like, if you want to get to the destination, like, okay, you messed up. It's okay. But repentance is, okay, now where do I turn now? Where do I turn back now? I got to get back to this story. I got to be known by I am, and I want to know I am. And when when I lose myself in that story then I'm living for what I was made to live for. So the ultimate goal is to know and to be known by I am. And this is why studying the whole Bible, including the Old Testament, and especially this passage, is so rich and, and, and good for us. Because if you don't understand Exodus 3, there's so much in the New Testament that you will just not get. So so let me just show you a couple places. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians in the first century. And chapter 1 verse 3, he is reaching back to Exodus chapter 3. Look what Hebrews says. The son, so who is I am? I am reveals himself throughout the Old Testament, but ultimately in the person of Jesus. Look what Hebrews says. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The the argument of the book of Hebrews is, you want to know who I, I am is? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He's the up to, up until this point, the fullest expression of who I am is the exact representation of his being. Uh, You can't really understand or you won't have a a, a good depth of knowledge of understanding of the gospels without understanding Exodus chapter 3. John's gospel in particular. John is constantly pointing us to Exodus chapter 3 and you probably didn't even know it. But but have you have you ever noticed the way Jesus talks in John's gospel? So sometimes people will say foolish things like, well Jesus never claimed to be God. And I would say because you haven't read John's gospel and you haven't read Exodus chapter 3. He claims it all the time. All the time. Let me just give you some examples. He says, I am the bread of life. So, so in the Greek, it's ego emi. It's a translation from the Hebrew of Yahweh. I am the bread of life. He says that. He says, I am the light of the world. There's seven I am statements in John's gospel. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Jesus constantly refers to him as that. You're like, well, maybe he's just saying who he is. Well, there, John, John knows what he's doing, but, but more than that, there's, there's two other places. Well, when Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and they ask for him, he says, I am. It gets translated in the the Greek as I am he, but it should just be translated I am. And when he says I am, they fall back. They they know he's saying something profound in this moment. But but more than that, in John chapter 8, 
There's this time where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're going to have a conversation, but they obviously have a, they, they've, they've got it loaded up front, right? Like if anyone starts a conversation and says to you, hey, is it true that you have a demon? Like, you know, it's a little bit off there, right? Like, you know, you might think that, you might feel that, but if you're like, hey, I don't mean to be offensive, but are you demon possessed? Like, they're not neutral in that moment. And so that's how they start this conversation with Jesus. Is it true that you're demon possessed? And they begin to talk and, and uh, they're like, well, we're, we're sons of Abraham. And Jesus says this in John eight fifty eight. He says, before Abraham was born, ego me, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. He's claiming Exodus 3. He's claiming the divine name. And they knew it. They knew that if that wasn't true, that's blasphemy. It says they picked up stones to murder him on the spot. So we want to know I am, be known by I am. So we focus our eyes on Jesus. We, we, we know him. We, 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 we pursue him. But I, what I want you to hear in Exodus chapter 3 is you're off the hook. You, you, you're off the hook. I am defines himself and he defines you. So you can just breathe and rest. Here, here's the deal. You're average, right? Like we're average. Like we have average marriages. We have average jobs. We have average intellects. Like in so many different ways, you and I are just average. And that's okay. You don't have to be at all. You don't have to define yourself. You don't have to show the world how much worth you have. I am tells you how much worth you have. Now, I, I get it. This is not a way to build a huge church, right? The way to build a church is not to tell your people you're average. Your kids are average. Man, I really, that will drive them away. But our kids are average. And you were an average little kid too. The way to build a huge church is to be like, oh, you got this. You're amazing. You're awesome. And God is just kind of like a, a divine CrossFit coach just helping you reach your goals. <laughs> but there's two problems with that. Man, that, that message of you're amazing. You're awesome. You got this. That, that sounds really, really good. Until it's not. And you continue to fail and you continue to fall short. And, and it, it, now it becomes just this oppressive thing. And the second reason why there's a problem with that is because it's not true. The message of the Bible is not that you're amazing, that you're awesome, that you got this. It is that God is amazing, he's awesome, and he's got this. So, if we were to uh, have name tags next week, we would all come out here and we'd put it on and you, you'd be tempted to put on John or Mary or, or Rick or something like that, but, but that, that's not what you should put on. You, you would put on, I am not. It would just be a church full of, I am not. But that wouldn't be the whole name tag, right? You would put, I am not, but I know I am. I didn't come up with that on my own. That's Louis Giglio's book. I am not, but I, am. I know I am. That's it. That's the message. I am not, but I know I am. And there's, a, there's just a piece to that. So whatever you're going through today, and are you struggling in an area? God says, I am with you. Do, do, you, need some, do you need some help? I am. Do you have addiction? I am. Do, do you need some help in your marriage? God says, I am. Are you struggling just with anxiety and stress? God says, I am. Whatever you need this morning, I am says, I'm with you. I am more than enough. I am able. I've got this. I'm inviting you to come to me and to rest. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, we, and we, we give you praise, honor, and glory that you would reveal who you are to us. God, we want to make it the aim of our lives forever and ever to know you. And by grace through faith, we are known by you through Jesus. And we thank you for that. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has not yet bowed the name, 
to the name of Jesus, the name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. I pray, Lord, that they would do that this morning by faith, saying, I, I give up what I know of me and I take what I know of you. And by faith, I accept you into my life. I ask you to lead me and guide me. I want to exchange my little story for your story. I pray that that would happen. Lord, for all of us that just continue to lose the narrative, continue to live selfishly or for ourselves or for our own glory, I pray, Lord, as we come to this table, once again, we would realign our lives with that which is ultimately true and good and eternal eternal for us. Lord, be with us this week. Help us to know a little bit more about who you are, who I am is. In Jesus' name, amen.